Hello, everybody. Welcome back or welcome to a new episode of the Rethinking Resources podcast brought to you by OMV. I am Steve Shade, your host on this podcast journey through the biggest challenges we are facing in the climate change transformation. This season, we are tackling the difficult questions and challenges of climate change head on. In this episode, we are asking, can we exit fossil now? Our guest for this episode is Georg Brasur, Professor Emeritus at the Technical University of Graz. Professor Brasur is a leading expert on electrical engineering and the energy transition, and also the scientific director of NET-ER, the New Energy Transition Europe Research Association, a platform for achieving the energy transition based on facts and scientific evidence. Based on his scientific research, Professor Brasur has mapped out a possible path to a successful transition to green energies, but he has come to some counterintuitive conclusions. For example, Professor Brasur envisions massive renewable energy farms in Africa, and he predicts that electric cars will fail to deliver the promised mobility revolution. Georg Brasur, welcome to Rethinking Resources. Hello to everybody. Yes, I will start with the big picture, I think. Okay. That's important. Then let me, let me cue you up for that. Uh, we have, of course, invited you to answer the big question of whether we can exit fossil now. And uh, we do look forward to your expertise on that. But first, let us set the stage. Uh, is the effort to limit a rise in temperatures to 1.5 degrees centigrade by the year 2050 already a failed cause? Yeah, I think it's, it's failed. Maybe we can meet the two degree uh, goal, but... 1.5 is very hard to, to, to obtain. But I think it's easier to understand the whole problem if you get the big picture. And the big picture is uh, that Europe always imported energy. 2019, it was 58% of the energy was imported, an enormous amount. This means also in the future we have to import energy. But with what kind of energy? We need current electricity. And the electricity we need to produce within the continent Hydrogen. Hydrogen we cannot transport between continents because we do not have ships or pipelines for that. We also cannot import electricity in huge quantities because we do not have power lines from one continent to the other. Therefore, we can only import, or what, what can we import? We can import hydrogen, but bind it by atomic binding to, uh, to carbon or to nitrogen. This gives the ammonia path or the hydrocarbon path. This means in the future we must import soon fuels. They could be liquid, they could be gases, and they have to be produced somewhere abroad where the harvest of the sun and the wind is much higher than here. And the reason why we have to go there is because we do not have those huge amounts of raw materials available to produce all that here in Europe. That's the, the big picture for that. Europe was not and will not be energy autonomous. We have to import energy. What would be the repercussions if we did do a hard exit from fossil fuels? Would the world grind to a halt? Uh, or no, what could I we said, use renewables to keep going? Europe is just 8% of the CO2 emissions. So the world will not really feel if Europe uh, reduces CO2 emissions significantly or not. But we will use competitiveness on the market. So all the industry within Europe will lose uh, let's say, we lose their space in the market. They will just, they have to move away. Our industry have to earn money. We, if we do not use fossil fuels here in, in Europe uh, further on, then we have to use green fuels. The green fuels are very expensive in the amounts we need, and they are not there now. And uh, therefore, the energy is very expensive, as everyone knows today. Energy is very expensive. And so the products are very expensive, and they're no more competitive on the market. And so they have to move away. Uh, take Fissmann uh, in Germany. They sold the thing for 14 billion. They sold the company to a US company because they cannot afford to build the products here in Europe when energy is so expensive. Okay, so let's talk about the technology and the limitations today. Uh, we'll get to the, the possible solutions that, that, that we can achieve in, in, in the coming years. Um, you say very importantly that the world needs green storable energy. Okay, so we have renewables, but it's difficult to store that energy. So at the moment, it isn't possible. Um, is there a solution on the horizon to providing on-demand renewable energy? And how might this solution look? I mean, it's, it's difficult. 
to, to draw on solar when it's, when it's nighttime um, and, and wind when the wind is not blowing. So how do we store it? Well, in principle, it is possible. It takes very long time because we only can collect wind and sun by means of uh, uh, windmills or by photovoltaics and delivers current. Current uh, is not an energy carrier. You need current to transfer energy from A, A to B, but current is not storable. You will say batteries, yes, batteries, but the amount you want to store or we have to store uh, is nothing compared to what we can store in batteries. So we can forget batteries for these huge amounts of fuel we have to store uh, to bring, let's say, the, the heat of the summer to the cold of the winter. And so we have to produce hydrogen in huge quantities out of the current. That's the first step. And in the second step, we have to transform the hydrogen into a transportable fuel because hydrogen cannot tr be transported between continents. We do not have pipelines or ships for that. And the same accounts for power lines. We do not have intercontinental power lines. And therefore, the hydrogen has to be produced here in Europe. Okay. Uh, let's talk about what we're seeing around us and, and, and what exists for the time being. I mean, you look around today in Europe and you see... Um, more and more windmills, um, more and more solar farms being built. Um, several fascinating lectures of yours are available online. Um, I've watched yeah, them yeah. Uh, in preparation <laughs> for our conversation today. Yeah. Uh, in these lectures, uh, you look to wind and solar as solutions um, to satisfy this massive energy need we have. So you suggest the creation of, of massive energy farms elsewhere, like in Northern Africa, and then with cables to bring that energy to Europe, calling these uh, solutions win-win. Uh, tell us more about this. The, the essential point is that we need enormous amounts of raw materials to build up solar and solar wind and the wind farms. So PV and uh, windmills consume lots of raw, of raw materials. At least I would say 50 or 100 times more than classic uh, caloric power plants. So we need enormous amounts of that. So this takes time. You need lots of workers who are able to to produce to make it. And so we have to bring all those pieces, all those, uh, let's say, green energy harvesting equipment to countries where the harvest is much higher, at least a factor of two. Then we save 50% of the raw materials. And there we have to trans uh, transform those materials immediately in a transportable format. And transportable format are liquid or gases, fuels, soon fuels, so either methane or alcohol, or it, so methanol, or it could also be liquid, like uh, uh, kerosene or diesel or petrol. But they have to be made there in those countries. Unfortunately, we need carbon for that. And this carbon has to be a green carbon, let's say a carbon that's sent in a closed circle, like nature does. Okay. But is it viable? Um, is this a possible solution? And yes, what would the timeline be? But it is a possible solution. But as I said at the beginning, we need time for that. And therefore, we cannot, uh, let's say, quit now using uh, fossil fuels. We have to use them, but save, save energy, save the fossil fuel energy. What we have seen in the last, uh, in a couple of, uh, last two or three or four years, the CO2 emissions of Europe went up instead of down because uh, we used more and more Coal, and coal is horrible. It produces around three times more CO2 em emissions compared to methane for the same energy you can get out of that by burning. And therefore, uh, we have to use methane further on, but less quantities of methane by using higher efficient components to, for, for the industry and the households, uh, heat pumps, for instance. But the heat pumps cannot directly be powered by methane. So you need let's say, uh, solid oxide fuel cells. With solid oxide fuel cells, you could produce in each household current, current not being delivered by the grid, but in your household, because the grid isn't strong enough to power all the households in Vienna. We have more than 800,000 of that. True. Um, okay, so this is an important component of the solution that, that, that you envision, using less energy, using what we have more efficiently. Yes. Um, we saw that um, yes. during the pandemic uh, and, and coming out of it, when gas prices went through the ceiling and beyond, um, we were told, turn down the thermostats. We saw people can actually do this. We can use less. So if we do that, 
and the solutions, the, the, the vision that you put forward is possible, what would the timeline be? When could we see the transition take place? At least 10 to 15 years, I would say, and that's roughly the time frame you need, for instance, to uh, double the power of the Viennese grid. We have about two gigawatt power in Vienna available, and to top that up, double the power, it would need about 10 to 15 years. Then all the households would have more than one kilowatt, like we have today, they would have two, perhaps, kilowatt. Average power at the household. And uh, so we have to, to, to get 10, 15 years uh, to bring up all this equipment, to introduce this equipment. And in between, we're saving energy, and these 10 to 15 years, we can bring up windmills and photovoltaics abroad and import more and more of those synth fuels. And these synth fuels will later on dilute the fossil fuels. And if it's the same chemistry, you will not feel that. So now we have 100%, uh, let's say, fossil gas. And later on, we will have 10%, 20 30% uh, diluted by synthetic gas, till at the end of the day, it's pure synthetic gas. Okay. Uh, one thing you don't mention in your lectures is hydroelectric, which I am just going to ask about because it, 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 a, a question popped up. So energy based on water, um, it's renewable. Um, here in Austria, it serves up to two-thirds yeah. of the needs. Uh, why don't you talk more about hydroelectric because as a solution? Worldwide, hydro is about 6% of the energy, of the primary energy. And nuclear is about 4%. That's almost nothing. So even if we would double it, it would be lovely. But it will not save, it will not solve the problem. We will still have the problem. So we are totally linked to wind and solar. For, and in the big picture. In a big picture, But yes. Austria is still going to be yes. able to use and its Austria, hydro. let's say, has like almost a unique selling position, almost like Switzerland, because we have pumped hydro in large quantities, and we can serve within the European grid, because that's one huge grid. 20 or 30 countries feed electricity to the grid, and we have one used like a copper plate. That's a huge grid. And this huge grid uh, needs uh, to fight those uh, times at night time when you have no solar or when there's no wind uh, to, to bridge this for a few hours. With a few hours you can do with hydro, mm -hmm. with pumped hydro for Austria. Maybe a little bit we can help uh, Germany. But for all Europe, the pumped hydro we have, uh, the grid could be stabilized for just a few 10 minutes, not more. Uh, if we would do it with caloric power plants and gas, we could power the grid for a year, a year. For the methane, we have stored it in our, uh, in our underground storages. So it's one year compared to a few 10 minutes. Okay. So this, this gives you an, an idea how high the energy density of fossil energy is, of methane and coal, but we do not want coal anymore because it produces so much CO2. But compared to methane and hydrogen, as I said, factor of three, so this, this is enormous, this, this, and it's easy to, to transport, uh, easy. Well, you have to bring it down to minus 162 degree in ships, but it's feasible. It's done since many, many years. But for hydrogen, it's even worse. But there is a technological solution. Yes, there are technological solutions for that. Okay, let's come back to uh, e-mobility and, and, and your stance on this. Many people see electric cars and e-mobility as a big part of the solution. Um, in a recent newspaper interview, I saw that uh, you believe electric cars are doomed to disappear. Uh, explain this surprising statement. Because stance. we have, in Europe, we have 60% green electricity in the grid. That's more or less uh, nuclear power uh, that is hydro, it is wind and it is solar. And wind and solar in Europe is 3.3%, not more, 3.3% worldwide. And it came up between 2019 to 2021, it is 4.6%. That's almost nothing. The power is very high, but the utility uh, rate of these power plants is not very high. Only 12% of the photovoltaics deliver uh, let's say, nominal power. So you have given on your, on your generator, let's say, one megawatt, and you can multiply it by yearly hours, this is 8,760 hours, and then you get the energy. Okay. But with photovoltaics, you have to multiply with 12%, and with wind, with 26%. So you need four times more windmills to get the same energy at the end of the day. 
compared to a calorie power plant. And this means uh, green energy, those volatile energy, uh, brings very high power to the grid, but not very high energy. And so we have to cap these peaks and store it somewhere. And uh, this could be and must be done in Europe by converting to hydrogen because industry needs huge quantities of hydrogen, but not as an energy vector. They need it to get the oxygen out of the materials, of the raw materials, steel and, and for building uh, materials. You have to get out the oxygen and you can do it with hydrogen. So it, I have to admit, you're losing me a little bit. So what you're saying is that if, if people bet big on, on e-mobility, the supply will, uh, the demand will outstrip the supply. The, you just can't power these things. Correct. And most of all, as we only have 60% uh, green energy, 40% is fossil. So each additional load we put into the grid and additional already those 40% that are too much, because for those extra 40%, it could be a washing machine or a dishwasher or a, or, or a car. If I charge, I have to, to provide this energy from fossil-based caloric power plants, predominantly coal-fired power plants. So as long as you do not have 100% green energy in the grid, electric mobility makes no sense at all in terms of CO2. What makes sense is electric drivetrain. The electric drivetrain delivers the high efficiency, mm -hmm. not the batteries. The batteries are the bad thing. The good idea is electric drivetrain, but we have to bring the energy we need to drive to the car and have to convert this energy to current. And this current is then stored in a small battery or small electric, let's say, storage. needn't be a battery. It could be something else. And from this, we propel the car. Okay. So when governments, when automakers, when consumers are betting big on e-cars, Maybe, but only if they switch to the electric drivetrain. The battery-based model is, is not no, going to make it. it doesn't make sense today. Okay. As long as you do not have 100% green current in the grid. So we should save 40% energy, electric energy. Not possible. Yeah? Okay. So we have to build more and more green power plants till we catch up to have 80% and 100% green power. And then it makes sense to have electric mobility. As, as long as we haven't obtained that, we delay the energy transition because we need more current mm -hmm. and each additional current means fossil fuels only if we're 100 percent green in the current then we can say okay we add new consumers like dishwashers or cars and then they are also powered green but this also means that we need huge quantities of storable green energy here in europe and predominantly this will be hopefully methane and not hydrogen, because for hydrogen, we do not have the equipment here. And new equipment means lots of raw materials. Raw materials means new fossil CO2 to produce those materials. And we, we don't need that because it's there. We have a gas grid, I think 500,000 kilometers, yes, within Europe. And uh, it, it, we have the power plants, and the power plants do not care if we operate it on fossil gas, yeah? or if you offer it on synthetic gas, it's the same. Okay, but isn't it a transition, a solution in progress, and, and sort of when enough people decide this is going to be the solution, then it happens? I mean, I'm sure there were a lot of people a century ago in the horse business who said, you know, there's no way you're going to build combustion engine cars and roads for them to run on and service stations. Uh, that's absurd. Uh, you know, this is what the horse business was saying, and then it happened. Uh, so you're saying even if the idea of, of e-mobility as it exists today reaches critical mass, it's not going to work technically. It is lovely that the industry already learned how to build a cheap electric drivetrain. Yeah. But it makes no sense uh, to get uh, uh, batteries now, predominantly from, from China. They're producing those batteries predominantly with fossil-powered, coal-fired power plants around 100 new fossil uh, coal-fired power plants uh, are introduced to the grid in China each year. So amazing. So 70, 75% of the electricity in China comes from coal. And so if you produce uh, the batteries there, uh, the CO2 emissions go up very much. And uh, additionally, we are totally focused on China. They're producing 70, 75% of the batteries for the world. 
Uh, so we're getting uh, more, uh, uh, we're more hooked to those, to this single country uh, with our mobility. If they do not deliver batteries, we have no mobility at all. Okay. But the electric drivetrain and an energy converter would be lovely. Energy converter could be a fuel cell operated, for instance, on methanol. It could be an internal combustion engine. So why isn't it being done? Because I think industry uh, found a nice uh, solution. Uh, you have the fleet, uh, CO2 emissions are limited. And a classic SUV operated uh, on fossil fuels cannot meet the fleet limits. But if you're producing electric vehicles, uh, then due to a law, uh, the current that is used to uh, charge the batteries in the car has zero CO2. It's physically wise completely wrong. It has to be, let's say, penalized with around 1,000 uh, gram CO2 per kilowatt hour because that's exactly what the uh, fossil fire power plant needs to produce the current. Mm -hmm. But as it's zero, uh, they have, uh, let's say, 90% sold fossil fuel cars and 10% are electric cars. This 10% electric car has zero emissions. This means in total the fleet CO2 emissions are lower than they actually are. And therefore they can sell the cars and earn money with it. Elsewise, they could not. So in the moment where this, this, let's say, this law is stopped and it comes from this simple, let's say, reasoning, uh, you define a car with how many liters per 100 kilometer. Where do the liters come from? From the pump. And what is an equivalent to the pump? It's the plug for the current. And therefore the current that comes out, electrons definitely have no CO2. The CO2 is produced when the electrons are sent to the grid in the power plant. And if this law uh, is, is skipped, then, of course, uh, they cannot meet uh, the limits, the CO2 limits of the fleet, and then it will s stop producing those huge cars and move to smaller cars with a very high efficient uh, uh, internal combustion engines. Okay, so if the, if the definition of what was clean and good was changed, then it would open the way for this technology you're speaking of. Okay, uh, let's, let's stick with some important terms. Uh, you use the term defossilization, not decarbonization. What's the difference, and why is that important? Because carbon, as I said, with synthetic fuels, it's essential to increase the energy density of hydrogen. So hydrogen is the dominant energy carrier, but not alone as hydrogen, but coupled by atomic binding to nitrogen or to carbon. If it's nitrogen, then we have ammonia, and if it's carbon, we have our hydrocarbons. And therefore, we cannot say decarbonize or stop carbon usage, we, as, as humans, uh, the nature will, would fall apart. Uh, nature consists in principle of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, then we need calcium for our bones, and phosphor for something pieces in our body, and then the rest is just less than 1%. So if we take carbon away, we fall apart. So carbon is essential, and therefore I say defossilization. I do not want fossil carbon in, in a circle. We need a circular economy for carbon. That makes perfect sense. Okay, this is what happens when you ask a scientist to explain what's obvious to scientists, and then people <laughs> who are not scientists get yeah. it. Then let me ask you, what is your honest assessment of the role companies like OMV are playing and will be playing in the energy transition? Austria and uh, OMV, is, is, it's very interesting here. Uh, close to Vienna, we have a few companies that have lots to do with, with oil. And oil means 95% of crude oil is used for mobility, let's say is burned either to get heat or for propelling cars. And just 5% are used for plastic and for cosmetics. So it, you think 5% is nothing. But uh, it's not nothing. Everything is plastic, more or less, when you're looking around. And this gives you a feeling how huge 5% are. And imagine what 95%. And we have to get rid of those 95%. And uh, OMV has two possibilities. One is to stay as a petrol uh, supplier. And the other uh, way could be uh, by means of Borealis. Uh, they own the majority. By, uh, let's say, moving more to plastic, to producing and helping to, to close the carbon cycle. 
So let's assume we are sending CO2 to Morocco in a pipeline. Five pipelines exist. Morocco produces hydrogen by means of wind and solar. And they make out of the hydrogen and the CO2 they get here from Vienna, uh, close to Vienna, uh, they sending back methane, green methane, in pipelines that are there, they already exist. Uh, so OMB has has big chance to be one of those those of those hubs for uh, for a green mobile for well for going green for carbon in a closed circle. So uh, the first season of of uh, rethinking resources was 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 focused on on circularity uh, and and OMV is is betting big on the circularity solutions. You say this is the right path. Yes, correct. Um, coming back to to our topic for this episode. Ultimately, what we're lacking uh, to successfully accomplish the energy transition, big question, um, is it technology, political leadership, corporate leadership, uh, a massive change in mass social behavior? What needs to happen for for us to really get on the right track and accomplish this in 10 to 15 years, like you said before? Yeah, I think the most important thing is that we save energy wherever possible. And saving energy means using goods longer. Don't throw your car away after five or 10 years, keep it longer. Uh, the same is when when we would move from our from our boilers in the household uh, to solid oxid fuel cells producing our own electricity, and then we could use uh, heat pumps. Heat pumps will not work in the grid of Vienna if each household would get a heat pump because the grid cannot supply; it's not powerful enough, and it will take 10 to 15 years to increase the power of the grid in Vienna. And the same accounts for all the other cities in Europe. So we need, let's say funny or interesting solutions to reduce uh, energy use of fossil fuels. And in parallel, we have to bring up with the materials we have worldwide, uh, the windmills and the photovoltaics, predominant in areas where we have uh, a very high harvest of uh, wind and sun. On the other hand, we additionally in Europe have to build lots of windmills and, uh, and uh, photovoltaics to get sufficient uh, amount of current for producing hydrogen and for supplying the grid. And these two, let's say, big users, they will consume more electricity we can produce. And in between, we have to store but this storage will not happen the next 10 to 15 years, I would say. They will still use fossil fuels and uh, methane power, power plants to bridge those gaps, those gaps in between where we do not have sufficient wind and sun. Okay, so uh, in the past few years, we've seen things like pandemics, war, black swan events um, readjust our priorities uh, and for us to have very clear, good goals and then for people to sideline these goals because something else intervenes. Looking at where we are today and all the challenges we face, are you an optimist or a pessimist? As an engineer, I'm always optimistic. Optimistic that we can make it. But it's, we need good leadership. We need a leadership that do not, uh, let's say, foster uh, electric mobility currently. They should use the money in, for other things and not for supporting electric cars. As I said before, it makes sense when we have 100% green grid. They should support, uh, should, should take this money and build uh, you know, new power plants, for instance, green power plants, or for instance, uh, uh, give some money for those solid oxygen fuel cells for the households to get electricity into the households for the heat pumps. For those things, it would make sense, but not for the other. Okay, so you do see a bright future for us after all. Yes. That's very good to hear. <laughs> Professor Georg Bresser, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your insights uh, with us here today on Rethinking Resources. Uh, to everybody listening to the episode or watching on OMV's YouTube channel, uh, if you do have feedback or questions, please send a message to podcast at omv.com. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, for more background information on the topics we have been discussing in this episode, and our guest, Professor Georg Brasseur. Uh, check out our show notes where you will find links to lots of valuable information. Uh, thank you so much again for sharing some time with us, and we hope you will uh, all join us again for the next episode of Rethinking Resources. Thank you.